and was just elected uh, in October of 2019. So new to us uh, and really appreciating her. So grateful you came out for us today, Leah. She is our critic and spokesperson on all things around children, families, and social development. And she's also the deputy critic for immigration and refugees and citizenship. And I've known Leah for a few years now, and I know that she is a strong advocate for human rights locally, nationally, and on the international stage. She works really hard uh, to make sure that people are aware of what's happening in our communities in our country and across the world on human rights issues. And I know that I actually met Leah when I was doing some work with Romeo Saganesh, who is also her partner and former MP for the NDP with Bill C-262, uh, the Indigenous Human Rights Act. And I know she was a strong advocate for that. So I just really appreciate her being here. She's worked as an educator. She's fought for human rights, uh, fought for climate change and is just an incredible activist. And I'm incredibly happy to have her here. So thank you, Leah, so much for coming out. I didn't want you to stop, Rachel. That was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's always thanks good for having me here. Thanks well, for thank having you. me here, Rachel. And and uh, thanks for the opportunity to like just talk about uh, the climate emergency, but also the bill. I really appreciate that a lot. Well, absolutely. So. And that is why you're here. You're here because you have tabled in the House of Commons Bill C-232. Um, and that is an act respecting a climate emergency action framework, which I know for so many of the people in my writing is a really important issue. And I think it is for every human being and yeah. every being uh, on this planet. So if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, that, uh, Bill, I would really appreciate it. And then we'll see what people have to say and what they what questions they want to ask. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, no, so when I became a member of Parliament, uh, I don't know if people are aware, but you can actually introduce a private members bill, but the order in which you can present them, um, they literally pick out of a hat. And I got 27. So pretty much I won the lottery. So particularly in a minority government, I actually have a really good opportunity to I get this through um, before uh, we have a potential election. So basically the, the purpose of the uh, bill is to recognize a clean, uh, safe and healthy environment as a human right. Uh, there's over a hundred countries in the world that already recognize a clean, safe and healthy environment as a human right. Canada doesn't. Uh, Canada doesn't. Um, and so what this uh, bill is, is, is aimed to do that, but it's also to um, legislate uh, Canada's commitment to take all measures necessary to reduce greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions in accordance to international commitments they've made. Uh, and these include things like the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Agreement, while complying fully with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because we will not achieve uh, climate justice, and I've said this very often, um, in the absence of fundamental uh, Indigenous human rights. And it, it, particularly in BC, if you look at a lot of the tensions um, right now, they it's, it's an intersection between land um, and uh, climate and environment. And so uh, when, when uh, drafting the bill, a central part of the bill was to have it framed around the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, something that was called upon um, by the TRC as the framework for reconciliation, meaning that we will not have reconciliation um, in this country in the absence of human rights, uh, in the absence of justice. So that's a very, very uh, critical part um, of the bill. It also um, urges uh, the Canadian government to recognize the current climate emergency as a national emergency. Um, and, and in that, that the government has to develop uh, an action plan to address it. I can't think of anything more pressing now than the pandemic. We know that what it's been like for the pandemic, particularly for communities that are vulnerable to systems. Uh, you know, we look globally 
uh, the impacts of climate change that, or the climate emergency has had already in, uh, on countries around the world. And, and we know with a pandemic, it'll make it just, uh, uh, just uh, much more worse. So I'll, I'll give you an example. In Manitoba, every year as a result of Manitoba Hydro, uh, many of the communities get flooded. This year we were lucky, but what happens is communities get flooded, people get uh, have to be uh, taken out of communities and moved to cities. One of the things we know in the pandemic is one of the ways to stay safe is social isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really difficult to do when you're being moved out of house and home and shipped off to uh, safer ground. Uh, so uh, one of the 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 um, purposes of the act uh, is to recognize uh, the climate uh, emergency as a national uh, emergency. So there's a few things uh, that are in the articles uh, of this act uh, that are really critical. Um, one, as I said, that the government takes all measures necessary um, to ensure that it respects uh, the commitments uh, that, that they've agreed to. But the other thing is that the minister uh, responsible for the environment must consult with Indigenous people and civil societies to develop and implement this emergency action plan. So it won't be something that the government does on its own, but it has to be done in consultation with indigenous peoples and of course, uh, civil society. Um, uh, sorry. Um, so within that, the, there's three uh, measures within that that they must take. One is to ensure that Canada meets at minimum the greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets set for 2030 under the Convention on Climate Change. And I say 2030 because now the federal government has reneged uh, to 2050. Uh, we will not meet uh, the, the climate targets. We will not meet the targets that we agreed upon uh, in Paris. This is unacceptable. And I think more and more Canadians are growing concerns, particularly uh, because it's the prime time to move towards a just transition. We see that the price of oil, uh, you know, Go, you know, it's not even worth the barrel it's in at this point. Uh, we need to protect workers. We need to make sure we're bringing workers along and moving towards a, a just economy. Um, and that includes a, a just green transition. Uh, the other thing is it's to ensure a transition towards a green economy by, among other means, increasing employment in green energy, infrastructure and housing. So to transition from, you know, uh, the fossil fuel industries, you know, uh, uh, industries that will not allow us to meet uh, climate targets and move workers uh, into a green economy um, and ensure the economic well-being, public health and protection of the national environment um, in Canada. And, you know, <clears throat> the, the, the most precious commodity uh, in the world is water. There are places in the world that, that where their whole water source has dried up or they don't have access to clean drinking water. Water can live without us. We cannot live uh, without water. So we cannot look at economic well-being without protecting our national or our natural environment. And that's something that this bill aims to do. So I'm going to oh, hold it think, off there oh, sorry, and then I'm going, to, yeah. I'll add off, I'm going to hold it off there. There's other things and I'll add them on as, as we go along. But I think, you know, the, the premise of the bill, you know, uh, meeting, meeting our international uh, obligations, you know, meeting uh, climate targets, moving towards a, a just transition that brings workers along in respect of fundamental Indigenous human rights in consultation with civil society and Indigenous peoples. Um, as as a as a premise for the bill, I think is really critical. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I just want to remind everyone: there's been a message that went out. Uh, we do have the question and answer box. We did get a few uh, questions uh, emailed to us as well, so I'll be able to pop those out. But if you do have a question, any people who are watching, please don't hesitate to go in the Q and A box there and just ask your question. We'll get to it as soon as possible. Um, but I just wanted to say, Leah, that I really appreciate what you had to say and talking about those international commitments and what we've agreed to. And I think, you know, you talked also about recognition 
reconciliation and how it goes hand in hand with justice. And I think that is something people are still struggling to understand what that really means. And I think it's it's so important to, to link those two together. So the first question I have is just, you know, when we look at the natural environment, the reality that we need to face climate change, that we have these international commitments that we're not even coming close to. And really in Canada, I think it's something we should be pushing our government. I know we have been doing that. We should be embarrassed. Canada is a place uh, yeah. where we could have a lot of innovation. And when we talk about workers that are in some of those industries, if we want to transition them to good paying jobs, we need to put that investment. So I'm just wondering, where is that place of balance between looking at how we're going to address the issue of the climate, but also the important part of reconciliation and justice on all Indigenous issues? Well, I, just a couple of things uh, I, I wanted to, to mention. Um, you know, we talk about one of the things that we've learned during COVID is we actually do have the resources to do the right things. We just lack the political will. And there's very simple things we could do right off the hop to invest uh, in, a, in a green transition. One is to end all fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, I don't think, for example, all the uh, big oil companies should have received oil bailouts uh, during COVID-19. I don't think oil companies uh, need bailouts. And I know a lot of Canadians, wherever you sit on that, uh, on that issue, agree that oil companies don't need corporate welfare from the government. These are monies that we could be um, investing in a green economy. But one of the, the, the biggest uh, crises... Uh, you know, in this in this country, and and certainly as we're seeing um, in British Columbia, I would say for a large part, I've been um, speaking about one of the reasons we have RCMP in this country is is to take forcibly take Indigenous peoples off their lands. That's why we have RCMP in this country uh, to begin with. Uh, to make way for development. And even uh, as we have this webinar, we see the same kinds of behavior, which is why uh, framing this within the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is so critical. Um, it, it doesn't mean that communities or nations can't decide if they want development or not. But what happens in this country is that, um, you, know, you know, in total violations of minimum human rights standards, um, you know, you have these corporations coming into communities, causing all sorts of conflict, and no development happens anyway. Why? Because we have over 200 Supreme Court rulings that say this is in violation of constitutional obligations under Section 35, for example, um, you know, free prior and informed consent, uh, the right to self-determination. It's also in violation of the United Nations Declaration on the rights of Indigenous people, which has been referred to uh, many times. I, I think sometimes when we think about reconciliation, we think about having it improve, improved relationships, getting to know each other. That's certainly an important part. But I can tell you, if you don't have a relationship where all parties basic human rights are respected, you're not going to be able to move that relationship along in a really positive way. And so I think this is a critical bill right now. I think it's a critical bill because we find ourselves um, uh, in a climate emergency. It's a critical bill because, I mean, even prior to the pandemic, we saw a national shutdown uh, across the country. Um, it's it's a bill that supports uh, efforts of reconciliation uh, by placing uh, this Climate Emergency Action Act uh, within a human rights framework uh, in consultation with Indigenous people and also civil society uh, to come up with a plan that works uh, rooted and grounded in human rights um, and also uh, ensuring that the government takes all measures necessary um, all measures necessary to ensure that any decision about development, uh, that they've exhausted all, um, all uh, options that are the most environmentally sound. Yeah. So the first concern is now the environment before development or any development. The first priority is ensuring and supporting and respecting the environment and human rights. Yeah. 
It's a def definitely a different framework and one I think Canada needs to become a leader in instead of uh, a, com a, a country that's really lagging behind. So I have a question here from Trish. She says, how do you see negotiating the environment with the provinces as it is a shared uh, jurisdiction? Alberta is particularly focused on oil, despite it not being their own in their own best interest to solely focus on the, the economy on oil. So if you could give that a, an answer. Well, I think I think it's important to to recognize that that uh, the uh, jurisdiction of provinces doesn't supersede uh, the fundamental human rights of Indigenous peoples or, uh, you know, rights uh, afforded through the Constitution in Section 35. Um, and, and the right to free prior and informed consent and self-determination. Um, you know, we have lots of Supreme Court rulings that have affirmed uh, affirmed just that. So I think, you know, there's certainly a jurisdictional um, um, uh, issues between the feds and province regularly, but you can't make decision in the absence of, of fundamental Indigenous uh, human rights that or uh, rights that are actually enshrined in, in the Constitution that's our, already part of the Constitution, which is why even if there's a there's a, a province that wants to do a development project, uh, the feds want to do it, why those projects don't always necessarily uh, go through because provinces are uh, obliged to honor the constitution so are the so is the federal government and uh, i know there's a lot of talk in the house of commons everybody always talks about um the rule of law like everybody always talks about this rule of law and and i think often people think when you talk about rule of law they think bringing in the police you know like putting down the hammer following the rule of law but that's actually not the rule of law the rule of law is actually upholding the constitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we've seen, even with, uh, you know, some of the uh, instances with RCMP that have happened uh, in the country, uh, you know, they have uh, received criticisms for, in fact, not upholding uh, the rule of law, particularly as it intersects with uh, resource uh, extraction uh, and development in this country. We need to change that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to change the foundation uh, of this country, uh, even around policing, much of it that is rooted uh, it, it directly in a violation of human rights uh, as, a, a, as it relates to land mm -hmm. or taking people off land. That's the, that's the history of policing in this country. Uh, and if we're going to move forward, then we have to look at those histories. We have to honor those histories and we have to find a better way of doing things that that honor human rights. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have another question here. And I, I just before I ask it, I I think this is, part. you know, we're seeing this across our country is this sort of reflection on what is systemic racism and how how do we decipher what that is? And I know I've heard from some people that it's very confusing, they don't understand. And, and what I keep pointing to is the outcomes. And if this is the outcome and there's a trend in that outcome, then that means there's something fundamentally wrong with the system behind it. Yeah. And we need to start to figure out why that's there and, and create some some ways of healing it because it's simply just not fair and we have to figure that out and I, I understand for some people it's complex uh, but the people who are living the realities of systemic uh, discrimination in, in its many forms are the ones that can pretty clearly inform us what those things are and I think together if we're you know I think of COVID-19 we keep hearing we're all in this together we are all in this together but how people are experiencing is very different based on so 100%. many different things and so how do we create something that is just more fair. And I think most Canadians understand the idea of fairness. It's just the pathway to get there is sometimes uh, yeah. something that seems challenging. So so I, I have an example, Rachel. Can I share an example? You can share it's an weird. example. It's totally weird. Yeah. Like we're talking about systemic racism, but it's so normalized, we don't even see it. Like it's just weird. I think it's weird, weird yeah. behavior. So going back to land. Like I owned a house, I rent now. Um, I'm, I, it's a much nicer life for me. I, if the if the washer breaks, I say, "Hey, my washer broke." Like I don't have to do anything. I'm actually really enjoying this renter's life. Um, but if some, you know, I bought a house. If somebody came to my house and said, "You know what? Hey, man, 
that's a beautiful house. I love your house. Your yard, it's lovely. I could live on your yard forever. Say, oh, yeah, thanks. But you know what? We're going to bulldoze your house because you know what? We're just, we're about to build a pipeline. So we're just going to bulldoze your house down. It's in the way. Look, I know it's disruptive. We'll give you a little bit of compensation. But we're, this happens to Indigenous people in this country all the time, every day since the beginning of colonization. And it's so normalized, people begin not to see it. People begin not to see it. In, in the riding I live, um, you know, we have, we're the third highest, uh, we have the third highest poverty rate in the, the country. We have many people that live in my riding because they've been uh, uh, dispossessed of their uh, communities, like since 2011, uh, because of flooding, never to be able to return home that, that now live in my riding, nothing to be done. Uh, about it. And in April, we had the the shooting of three Indigenous folks in 10 days. One was a 16-year-old girl, uh, talented. Like I saw a painting she did, so talented, so amazingly talented. I could I could almost get to know her through the painting. Like she was that brilliant. She She probably was 13 when she did that particular painting. But you know, for Indigenous folks, particularly in this country, if we want to talk about why, you know, uh, uh, acknowledging or not acknowledging, respecting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People uh, in this bill is so critical. You know, when you, when you, one of the, the, the most cruel things that's happened in this country is the, the wrongful dispossession of lands of Indigenous people that for many of us have left us homeless on our own lands without say, without consultation. They just take us and move us over. In Manitoba, the Dene have been relocated four times. Four times. Oh, sorry. You know what, man? I know this is your house. You like your house. It's a lovely. Okay, sir, you're in the way. We'll just move you over. Uh, um, you know, there's Easterville in Manitoba. Same thing, hydroelectric development. Oh, sorry, the dam, the water's coming through. Sorry, I know this is your home, but you're going to have to move over because the flooding's coming through. We can't do this anymore in this country. And we can't do this anymore in this country in a way that is enforced through militarized police and violence. We, ha we cannot do this anymore because if we really want to... Um, you know, move towards reconciliation uh, in this country, a core of that um, is, is land. Mm -hmm. You know, when you take away people's land, you take away their power. And you take away their culture because culture is learned through the world and where you live. And so, you know, this bill is really critical for everybody. One, because we are all, we want to talk about all in this together. We are in a climate emergency and every decision we make right now will impact all of us. You know, now we're connected, you know. Uh, we need to do this better because if we are going to be a better country, then we need to ensure everybody's human rights are respected. That is not happening uh, in real time today, uh, whether in, in, in all different ways. and. And I think, you know, this bill provides that framework. You know, the federal government uh, has promised once again to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This is something that they need to do, uh, but they can't utilize that, say, okay, we, we're going to adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, but hey, man, that right is inconvenient. So we will just not respect that, right? And we need legislative protection. I think it's good for all Canadians in terms of the, the environment, uh, but it's also legislative protection that's really needed by Indigenous people to ensure that we have some sort of protection um, when people knock on our door, smash down our door, and then start bringing in cops, telling us what to do with the door 
we can't do that anymore in this country. We have to be kinder. We have to be more respectful. Uh, and that only happens if you respect somebody's human rights. So that's why I put this bill uh, forward. I almost, I almost um, did a, a, a revival of Bill C-262 because I was so disappointed. Mm -hmm. And then the government said that they were going to introduce do sit and adopt and implement it. I should have never trusted them, Rachel. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a little time. We'll keep working on that one. Yeah. So we've got a question here uh, and it says, uh, isn't eco justice working on this? Uh, something similar to your bill is what I'm assuming. I feel that there is so much power in the wrong hands that will resist this. Do you think we will need to use the law to create justice for all? Well, you know, absolutely. I think, um, first of all, I think people working together on the bill. I know the uh, Green Party has uh, said they want to endorse my bill as well. Um, I don't think that human rights should ever be a partisan issue. Um, and I think having legislative protection um, is, is absolutely critical uh, because you never know who's going to get in government. Uh, you you never know what can happen. I know a lot of people say, well, you know, they they put these these bills through and and uh, they do it anyway. But at least we have um, you know something to stand on, and certainly legislative protection. If you look at Bill C two six two, any sort of development, anything going forward, would have had to have been compliant with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It's something that would have replaced the Indian Act, which is a human rights violating uh, a piece of legislation, uh, with human rights. And I think we we have a history in this country. This country was built on the wrongful dispossession of lands of Indigenous people without the consent of Indigenous people, real real consent. And uh, we we need some legislative protection. So I'm going to do a plug, a shame, can I do a shameless plug? Shameless plug, If you go. want to get involved in the bill, okay, I'm going to do this. It, it'll be like a, t a telethon by the end. I'll do this like four or five times, okay? okay. Go to Leah Gazan, L-E-A-H dot C-A slash bill C two three two, simple. Madrin will put it in the chat. Can you do that, Madrin? Thanks. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah. I think it's important because when people engage with the process, and we saw uh, with Romeo's bill, uh, you know, C two six two. I said that a lot of times uh, when I was advocating for it. We saw people walking uh, across parts of Canada to speak out on this issue. And I think it really grows that awareness across our country and on our communities of these issues and how important they are. And I hope uh, that what they do is open up the opportunity to have these kind of discussions. And, you know, Trish here uh, didn't really give us a question, but I think this is really important where she talked about it's, you know, if we're going to talk about systemic racism, it really is across the board. It's disabled people or people living with disabilities, yeah. racialized women. Um, you know, I have a mother who's uh, got a severe uh, physical disability, and I know that she is often ignored. Uh, yeah. I have a son who's got a, a learning disability that makes it very hard for him 100%. to get mad at me yeah. <laughs> for talking yeah. about it, but he's got some particular challenges, uh, and there it's an invisible disability, so it's, yeah. it's really important. And I think when we look at a lot of these, you know, being a woman, there's still so much injustice, and, and we've seen that most recently, of course, with the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And it's similar to what you said, like, we're just going to wait a little longer, you know, yeah. and it's like, well, how long do these communities yeah. have to wait? They've already waited long enough. Uh, women are still and girls are going missing. They're being murdered. We can't continue. So I think it is important. And I really appreciate what Trish said about it's a lot of forms of discrimination. And there's the intersection, of course, of discrimination and all those layers uh, that we always need to be looking at and addressing. And I think your bill is yeah. a start to that. And, and that is yeah. part of creating that framework so that we look at things fundamentally different. A hundred percent. And, you know, it absolutely true. I mean, uh, if you want to talk about uh, people who don't fit into system, there's all sorts. I think that's why, you know, I'm a bit of a raging machine, you know, sometimes about it. But, you know, when I see all these corporate bailouts, when I saw uh, during sur or during uh, the pandemic, like these huge uh, bailouts to big business, and then I think about, 
you know, all uh, the, the folks that are being left behind or the fact that, you know, the disability community had to wait for a disability week to get a tax credit that many people with disabilities can't even benefit from. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we can we can do differently. This this bill specifically um, aims at a clean, uh, health and safe environment as a human right, something that benefits all of us. No matter where we are in life, we all need a clean, healthy and safe environment to live. And this is a human right that has been recognized in over a hundred countries in the world. Yeah. yeah. So let's yeah. join in. So I have a question uh, from Kent and he's asking, do you have a sense yet about whether the other parties in the house will support your bill? And do you see signs yet of civil society organizations across the country getting mobilized to lobby the parties and their individual MPs to support the bill? Yeah, a hundred percent. So, um, you know, organizations like 350.org uh, are really interested in the bill. I know uh, locally, um, you know, Manitoba Energy Justice Coalition is really uh, interested uh, in supporting uh, the bill as well. We're just starting to rev up the campaign. We had this huge um, launch of the bill. It was magnificent. And then we went into a pandemic. It was like, yeah. And then it was like, Womp. so <laughs> still we're just trying to rev up the campaign for the bill um, again uh, now, and that's what we'll be looking looking to do 100%. So, um, like I said, keep track of the bill. Go to K okay, Infomercial Leah Gazan L E A H G A Z A N um, dot C A slash Bill C two three two. Well, and so, it's important, uh, and I think people are going to be following, and I hope they do, because, you know, I always say to people, um, you know, I can go in yelling at a minister about a particular issue, uh, but if I have 300 signed letters in my hand, there's just more impact. So it really matters. I, I hope people 100%. that understand that when we're pushing things, uh, it really matters if we keep doing our work, but we need other people to support us to to sort of build that that sort of general discussion so that people are talking about it and so that MPs quite honestly feel the heat. No, this is this is true. So people power is huge. Because I don't really think governments do things because it's the right thing to do, Rachel. Maybe I'm kind of a negative bunny. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't think I don't think governments do things because it's the right thing to do. I think they do things because um, a public pressure because they want to get reelected and uh, they base it on money. And I think when the public pressure is enough, uh, I think that it's easier to get things through. I think that's how certainly with all the lobbying that happened, that's how we uh, got through Bill C-262 through the House, although it was stalled in Senate, Senate and, and killed by uh, five unelected, unaccountable uh, undemocratic senators. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that the only reason we got it through was because of thousands of people across the country who walked, wrote, did postcards, petitions, um, lectures, teachings, uh, in, in a concerted effort for over almost three years that it, that it made it that far. That's how powerful people power is. And you know, I always say very much like you, Rachel, I'm very unimportant in all of this. You know, it's all the people that you have beside you that are pushing something that that gets it through. I also just just to go back when I ran, I ran on, you know, bringing the, the grassroots in the House of Commons and, uh, you know, trying to uh, develop kind of a seamless relationship on the ground because I'm a, a long time on the ground advocate. And I'm going to try and do that with this bill. This is a, a bill that was inspired particularly by young people, uh, inspired by a need uh, to ensure the protection of uh, fundamental Indigenous uh, human rights, particularly as it relates to land matters that are causing so much violence in our communities, uh, uh, whether it's you know um, with man camps in our communities or, uh, you know, removing us from lands, you know, to, to have something to directly uh, deal with, with some of those uh, matters. Um, but 
it's inspired by people and you know reasons why people elected me uh, and you know commitments that I made uh, when I ran and so this bill kind of was all encompassing of that uh, and so like I'm hoping to to get people more mobilized on the ground. Well it makes a big difference and I know in the last parliament I did a private members bill on um, making housing uh, one of the rights that all Canadians would have in, in the Bill of Rights in, in, uh, in our country. And it was not successful. The Liberals voted against it uh, in the, when they were the majority. Including, really... including the, the, the fellow that I replaced here. Yeah. Shameful. And it was it was devastating. And I remember when we had the vote, the minister came over and said, don't worry, we're doing a national housing strategy and we're going to include the right to housing. And I said, but will it actually be legislated into our Bill of Rights? And he said, oh, don't, Rachel, don't worry, it's going to be okay. And of course, what happens, and, and we're seeing this again and again, is people are displaced, they have nowhere to go, the homeless population yeah. is growing. We have a lot of people across this country who have no over 250,000 people uh, that have no no safe place yeah. to live, that are couch surfing. Um, you know, I was just talking to someone recently who actually finally has a place, and they said they have a hard time sleeping in their bedroom because they're so used to being on the couch, they keep sleeping out on their couch. So. Yeah. Um, uh, it's just wrong. And and of course, there was nothing. Actually, what was in the national housing strategy was we we're going to have a consultation about the right to housing. And I'm like, people who don't have a home do not yeah. want to talk about it. They need a home. And this is not about us building a bazillion homes because everybody's like, we're just going to give everybody a free house. No, this is about having a plan and making sure that that housing is out there and available. So it, it frustrates me how much we have to deal with That's this. That's a no brainer to me, Rachel. I would have voted for you, Bill. Well, if thank I was you. There, I would have voted for your bill. That's a no-brainer to me. It's, a, <laughs> it's a minimum human right. It's and, a minimum and, human right. Yeah. And what does it do yeah. to people? Like I remember somebody coming to me and saying, "Well, you know, it's costing money uh, for the municipality for us to have uh, all these people. We have to buy buy or rent out the." the bathrooms on the side of the road so people have somewhere to go to the bathroom and I said and they said it's really hard for certainty for our businesses and I said well it's really hard to have certainty when you don't have a home right so 100%. Let, like let's look at that kind of certainty anyways I'm sorry to no no but, that, but, but it, no, it but all it, links together to me it does, it does and even when I was talking about people who have been displaced uh because of climate change I mean, we're looking at like a, an issue around homelessness now. Just think about all the impacts of climate change globally um, and how many people will be d displaced um, as a result of, of climate change uh, in the future, the, even displacement that we currently see as a result of climate change. So this exactly. is a critical, this is a critical uh, issue, uh, particularly, like I said, like we're in a pandemic. <laughs> You know, like one of the things we talk about is social isolation. You can only do that if you have a home. Uh, you can only wash your hands if you have access to clean drinking water. And we know in, in Northern Ontario, for example, there's some communities that have been so polluted by uh, resource development that they've had to be uh, evacuated because their water is so contaminated. So when we talk about a clean, healthy and uh, safe environment as a human right, uh, this is an issue even in our own community where as a result of not of respecting the environment, um, it's it displaces people all throughout the country uh, annually, more specifically Indigenous folks. Uh, you know, if, if you look at some of the developments that have happened um, at the expense and around uh, Indigenous communities through throughout the country. So it's a very critical bill. They yes, asked me to yes. go to France. I was saying to Rachel, they inv they liked the bill so much they invited me to France. Maybe they'll we'll adopt my it. bill. Maybe they'll maybe they'll adopt my bill in France, Rachel. Well, that would be fantastic. And yeah, I think I that's an important one. Here. I, we want <laughs> them to do it again. We're gonna fight for Canada, but we'll see what we can do to get it around the world. So, but that's interesting because one of the questions that we were asked through email is where are some examples of where the right to a safe, clean, healthy environment is the law? So do you have any examples for us about where it is and where it's working? Yeah, so there's many countries uh, in the world that, that have adopted it. I know in um, Bolivia, uh, they to totally groundbreaking, uh, adopted um, all sorts of uh, environmental 
rights. Uh, just in uh, Bolivia, there's countries all throughout Europe that are adopting uh, legislation that have honored, um, you know, a clean, health, safe, uh, sustainable environment as a human a right. There's a recognition. And Canada um, is actually... Uh, be actually behind behind the the, the game um, in terms of meeting climate targets, including doing our part um, in in the international community to meet those targets. And you know what that was one of the examples. I mean, recently Canada failed to secure a seat on the Security Council, uh, and there's many reasons for that. Uh, one is for example, their failure to do what they need to do to meet climate targets, for example, okay? Uh, their failure to uh, uphold human rights, if you look at places like Fiji, where they have uh, mining companies, Canadian mining companies that are extracting resources on Indigenous lands there and violating all sorts of rights. You know, this is something that uh, the, the world is not blind to. And yeah. so, you know, Canada, uh, there's a reason why we didn't get a Security Council seat, including a violation of Indigenous human rights right here on our very own soils, uh, including a violation of rights on our very own soils, uh, you know, uh, on many levels, even outside of Indigenous communities. There's reasons why we didn't get that Security Council seat. So I think, you know, this time maybe Canada can follow. Uh, the lead of other countries around the world who have adopted uh, uh, laws to protect uh, the environment. Well, and I think what you're saying is really important. And one of the challenges that I see in the work that I do in my own writing is, you know, sometimes when we talk about addressing issues around climate change, uh, you know, I, of course, first thing I always hear is, well, you fly across Canada, so you're using oil, <laughs> so yeah. you don't get to speak to this. But I also hear from workers who are like, this is the sector. When I got involved, I didn't know it's a good paying job. It supports my family. And I think, you know, when we talk about just transition and I have chats with people, they, they're afraid. They think that just transition won't happen, uh, that they won't be able to get a job that pays them well enough to live. And I think these yeah. are just everyday working people. And I'm just wondering, as you look at your bill, um, you know, how does that fit in uh, with that idea? I mean, you spoke to it earlier about a just transition. I know, for example, in Alberta, there's that group Iron and Earth that's doing some really innovative work with the oil industry, looking at their skills and saying, if we move towards a greener economy, these are the things that we could do that would be good paying jobs and also reflect the skills that we already have in the work yeah. that we do today. And I think, you know, to me, I'm always trying to find ways to further the conversation instead of just sort of staying in that place of fear and defensiveness. We need to find yeah. a way because the environmental is fundamentally changing and we need mm -hmm. to change with it and other countries are Canada can't uh, sort of leave this behind yeah so speaking to that so here's here's my argument I don't think people love oil and gas like I, I know that there's t-shirts that say I love oil and gas I don't I don't agree with that I think they love feeding their families I think they love paying their bills they love to be able to afford a home that they can live in uh, you know, I, I think that's what they love. I don't think they love oil and gas. I think that's a real, um, uh, you know, I, I think that's inaccurate. Mm -hmm. So I don't fault workers, you know, I don't fault people who want to support their family. Oh, it's terrible. You want to support your family. Oh, that's awful. I mean, I don't, but I think we need to, like you said, Rachel changed the discussion and it's about choices. And unfortunately this government uh, and consecutive liberal and, and conservative government have not invested uh, in real choices. And, and there's ways to do that. There's ways to do that now that won't hurt workers. Because I don't know any oil corporations that are fighting for workers. I don't know any big oil companies uh, and CEOs of big oil companies that are saying, we are worried about the rights of workers because the conditions that people have to work in uh, when they work uh, in this kind of big oil industry are often long hours, uh, unsafe working conditions, uh, in conditions that are not very often good for their health, their physical health. 
Uh, so I don't see any corporations fighting for workers, but there's ways we can do that. One is by divesting from the fossil fuel industry, uh, from divesting in corporate welfare or bailing out a big corporations. We just bought a, a, a $13 billion and growing a TM, TMX pipeline uh, that is not getting off the ground, uh, that is not going to make money to be able to pay for itself. Uh, these are examples of government waste. I mean, these, instead of uh, investing in that, they could actually reinvest in a green economy that brings workers along like things like um, increasing employment opportunities and green energy, providing training, like that's billions of dollars we're talking about. Like, can you imagine if they actually invested in a green economy, uh, investing in green uh, uh, infrastructure? I know in my riding, for example, uh, we have a lot of old housing stock. Uh, we could be employing uh, people to retrofit those houses. And there's actually plans that have been put out by, by folks like Sean Loney that show how you can retrofit uh, houses at zero cost to government and zero cost uh, to the owner over, over, an, an, um, over a duration of time through interest-free loans, for example. So, you know, we know we have to transition. Even the federal government has indicated that they have to transition. Unfortunately, they're 20 years past what they committed to in terms of having the transition. And they are not demonstrating through action the kinds of investment that need to be made uh, in order for us to, to move to, towards that transition, which brings us back to people power. Uh, and, you know, I know that there's Canadians from across the country that are growing more worried uh, about the environment. I drove during Bill C-262 times, actually. I drove um, between, like, Ottawa along the, the St. Lawrence. And the houses, like, it's slowly, as, as you know, um, the water melts, the ice caps melt. The water is increasing and you slowly see that road disappearing. Like we are running out of time. There's glaciers that are falling uh, in, the, in the water. And sometimes we might feel more removed, especially in the prairies because we have barely any water. We have a dirty little red and Assiniboia river so we can't see it. Right? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So you feel removed from it. But I think of a lot of folks in BC and your beautiful oceans and the fish that live in the oceans. I, I wouldn't mind listening to some of your thoughts on there, like salmon, I know in your area is so vital. Um, you know, if we don't look after the environment and move towards a just transition, we'll have all sorts of industries going in the tanker, but we also will lose a way of life uh, that we've grown accustomed to, depending on where we we live in the world, you know. Um, so so I think it's like I'll give you another example. Hybrid cars. I have a I have a woman. Uh, she's an MP uh, here, or sorry, an MLA here, um, who bought Malaya Marcelina an electric car. It costs her 300 bucks a year to plug in. You know, they could be giving subsidies so that people might want to buy vehicles that, uh, you know, don't need to use fossil fuels, as an example, and train people on how to build uh, those kinds of vehicles, for example. So I don't think the, the options aren't there. I think the political will is lacking. And I think the, the kind of rhetoric that has come out from big oil to really um, prevent uh, discussions about anything other than oil and gas, even though we know we only have 52, less than 100 years left, even in oil and gas. So we have to transition anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And a world that's heating up by the minute. Um, like we need to, we need, we need a just transition and we need a just transition that ensures uh, workers are, are looked after first and fundamental uh, Indigenous human rights are upheld. 
Yeah, I agree. Well, obviously, I agree. And I think, you know, you spoke about uh, the retro retrofit program and how meaningful that is as well. And the fact that when it was when it was that there was federal support for it, it was used a lot. And yeah. then they stopped it. And why did they stop it? Because people were using it and it was costing money, but the impacts are profound. And again, it's about making a decision about what matters more. What matters more, is it money or is it the environment? And, and you know what? You figure it out as you move forward and it takes time. I understand that, but we don't have time to waste. And now is a good yeah. time to start. And I think that's the other thing is, uh, you know, when I have conversations, it's like, you're going to, cut everything now like everything's going to stop and and I don't think yeah. anyone is saying let's stop everything today what we're saying is we need to stop we need to change we should start now because the longer we wait to start the worse it is for the environment but it's also worse for the the workers who are in those fields that will need yeah. good paying jobs afterwards so let's yeah. let's not be uh reckless with this. Um, so I guess the last question of tonight uh, came in from email and it says, uh, what will be the implications if Bill C-232 is passed through the House of Commons and gets through the Senate? Uh, what will be the changes that we see in our country? Well, I think first of all, you know, because we are, you know, following the lead that Canada will finally recognize a clean health, sustainable environment um, as a human right. Um, but, you know, there's there's measures in terms of the development. One, uh, it would be in consultation with civil society um, and Indigenous people. And there's also uh, accountability and transparency measures within it to make sure it happens. So uh, if, you, if you have an opportunity to look at the bill uh, at Leah Gazan, L-E-A-H-G-A-Z-A-N dot C-A slash Bill C-232. Um, it has um, articles in it that, that oversee the development of uh, the bill. Um, which include upholding the provisions of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, and also to take into scientific knowledge, including Indigenous science and knowledge in relation to the environments and its protection, as well as the responsibilities of Canadians towards future generations. It will also, um, you know, ensure that the government uh, takes all uh, measures necessary um, to fight climate change, uh, to uphold their international obligations, uh, including things like I mentioned before, the Paris Agreements, um, in compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and it also will force the government to mitigate, to take all nece uh, necessary actions to mitigate the impacts of climate change, meaning if this bill was in place, uh, they wouldn't be spending $13 billion on a, a TMX pipeline because that's not taking all measures necessary uh, to mitigate the, the impacts of climate change. The government certainly didn't look at all other options available um, to put the environment and human rights first. So it's rooted in uh, human rights. It's, it, uh, it, it uh, respects science. It respects international uh, obligation. And it also it respects the rights of workers and uh, ensuring that workers are invested in and brought along. So, for example, uh, instead of bailing out the big oil companies and CEOs, that money, they could have bailed out workers. They could have used that money to bail out workers, but that's not happening. So this bill uh, supports those really positive changes, I think, for everybody. Well, and I think it's really exciting uh, because we have to stop being afraid. And I hope that people continue to have conversations about this because some people are afraid and some people are just fighting so hard to address climate issues. And we have to find a way to continue to push people out of their comfort zone, uh, and into something new. And it's hard. I, I know that sometimes when I see something a certain way, it's hard for me to see it differently. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate you doing this because I think it speaks to all of the different parts and says we're, we're going to all work hard together to make sure that no one is left behind. Yeah, 100%. Thank you so much, Rachel. It was so nice. Thank you for joining us, everybody.
Yes, I really appreciate it. And just so you know, uh, you know, if you want to write a letter to the minister on this bill, if you're uh, a member, if you're one of my constituents or Leah's or anyone, uh, please send the letter to the minister. CC me if you're in my riding and also always CC Leah. And remember, if you're in a riding that isn't belonging to one of us, because I promise that I will support this bill when it comes time, uh, just remind you to make sure you include Leah because we always want an opportunity to follow up with every single MP. And if we have a couple of letters from their constituents, so you know people across Canada, let them know you know, Leah's been great about putting on here her website uh, to look up Bill C-232. So look it up, follow it. Uh, and thank you all for coming and, and showing your commitment uh, to the climate and, and really the act of justice. And, you know, really, at the end of the day, uh, to me, the climate is worth it, uh, regardless of, of us we are here and we should really appreciate the opportunity to live on this planet and not treat it so disrespectfully. We have a long history and now let's take that next step to make it right. And of course, we'll make sure to post this because we've recorded this whole thing so people will get to, to watch it later on. And uh, we really look forward to hearing your comments and emails uh, afterwards. So thank you so much, Leah, for coming. Thank I you, really Rachel. appreciate your time. Rachel Blady. <laughs> Leah Gazette, it was awesome to be with you. And um, I just, yeah, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you for the many people who sent emails and uh, thank you to everyone. It was a great day. And thank you, of course, Leah, for continuing this amazing work. Thank you. And thank you for all your work. She's the best whip ever. <laughs> she is. I'm and so everybody's like, out. what does spread that it. mean? Spread the it rumor. Means I, yeah, the, yeah, spread the rumor. I'm a good keep whip. Keep us all organized. I am a good organizer. I'm a good organizer. 100%. I take that. Uh, and I appreciate <laughs> it. And Leah, I appreciate all that you bring to the table as well. And and I think it's really important that we continue these conversations because and I, we have I can't to wait to change. see you in person one time. One day. I'm going to the house. Maybe one day we'll see each other. In yes, the house I am not going to the house probably in August, but uh, yeah. have a good trip. Thank so you. again, thank you, everybody. Thanks, and everybody. I will talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.